Welcome back. This is the adventure, the vocabulary of the King James Bible. We're at chapter 17. In chapter 16, we looked at punctuation and we started to look at the use of shall and will. Now in chapter 16, we're going to continue looking at a few considerations about the verb will. The King James Bible has surprising ways in which variations of this word are used. For instance, the word wills, as in he wills us to do good, or he wills us to be good, simply does not appear in the King James Bible anywhere. You won't find it. However, there are some forms of this word that are used in a very special way, a definitive way, a definite way. Take, for instance, the word willeth. It only occurs and appears once in the entire Bible. Now, I find this surprising because the ETH or TH verb endings, when used with a third person pronoun, are extremely common with most verbs, as we've already seen. But with the verb will, we don't find those endings really, but we do find generally he will not he willeth and certainly never he wills willeth is used once in a particular circumstance to find this we turn to romans chapter 9 verse 16. this verse reads so then it is not of him that willeth nor of him that runneth but of God that showeth mercy. This is the only instance where the term willeth is used. And it's used to heighten and draw attention to the way in which God shows mercy. Because it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Here we see the literary devices, alliteration used to tie these words together and bring about an emphasis that ends in a crescendo. Willeth, runneth, showeth. It is God himself who decides to show mercy. It is nothing to do with the actions of anybody else. In other words, it's not because you want or you will that God would show mercy or you expect him to show mercy or that you've got a good case to present for him showing mercy. This is nothing like the rule of law of our country where the plaintiff or the uh, convicted person has to put forth a firm or sound argument or reasons why clemency or mercy ought to be shown to show that there are in fact mitigating circumstances. You can't show any mitigating circumstances to God. There is no way that any of us can appeal to God to show mercy from anything that we offer, do or explain. It's not of him that willeth, it's not of him that runneth, who prepareth or seeks to prepare or run to. It's of no effort, there's no effort that you can put into it that is going to influence God to show mercy. The only reason he shows mercy to all is because he is by nature merciful and he wants to show mercy. It is not connected with any attribute or attitude within us. He shows mercy to all 
by offering Christ for all, by the cross of Calvary for all men. He's shown to be merciful. He shows mercy, not because we deserve it. We may need it, of course, but we certainly don't deserve it. And there's nothing that we can do or offer that would incline God to show mercy. He already has decided in his own will and determination to show mercy because that's who he is. So it's not of him that willeth. Only used once in the entire Bible in this form. The next word that's only used once again is the word willfully. It's only used once in the entire Bible in this form. And it's a different book. It's in the book of Hebrews, admittedly. But it's still concerning the aspect of God's mercy and the way in which he's shown that mercy in the way in which he provided the sacrifice. Let's read this. It's Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Well, what is the knowledge of the truth that we've received? It's mentioned through Hebrews. The truth that they received was that you could no longer bring a sacrifice to God for your sins. Those sacrifices in the Old Covenant and the Old Testament were only symbolic. They could never actually wash away sin because the blood of bulls and goats can't wash away sin. They were a picture of the only blood to be shed that can, in actual fact, wash away sin. And that's the blood of the lovely Son of God, the pure, righteous Son of God, Son of Man, His blood, His sacrifice. So if we try to bring forth our own sacrifice after we've sinned, it isn't going to be effective. It isn't going to achieve anything because there remaineth no more sacrifice of sins because the sacrifice for sins was once and for all. If we sin willfully by offering sacrifices that have been done away with and finished with, because simply put, it is finished, there is no more sacrifice that we can offer of by ourselves or from ourselves. There never was actually, but there certainly isn't now because God shows mercy. And the mercy that he showed was in sending and giving his own pure son, the son of God and son of man, to die for sin once, to be the sacrifice. The veil of the temple was torn in twain. The sacrifices that men bring are over and done with. They can never be brought again. There is no point in bringing them again. They're totally ineffective. Building Jerusalem again, building a temple again, getting the altar going again, starting sacrifices again, whoever starts them is entirely pointless because there was one sacrifice forever. Jesus died once and for all. It is finished. One sacrifice forever. The Old Testament sacrifices were merely looking towards the sacrifice of the cross on the cross of the Son. Whether you call it a cross or whether you call it a tree or whether you call Jesus, Jesus or whether you call him by a Masonic Jewish name, 
makes no difference. He has died. God in his mercy gave him as a sacrifice. We did not sacrifice him. I can tell you that the people who saw him and had him strung on that cross, whether it's the Roman Empire or the Jews or the family or anybody standing there, they were not offering a sacrifice for sins. It was God who offered the sacrifice for sins. There is no more sacrifice for sins. So we see the two forms of this word, will, as seen in willfully and willeth, are unique in the King James Bible for a particular purpose. Nobody can atone for sin because we're born in the knowledge of the truth. Aren't you glad that the second Adam made sacrifice for you on the cross? And it wasn't because you pleaded for it or wanted it or, or produced just cause for it. It's God who showeth mercy and it's God who sacrificed his own son. We did not take part in that sacrifice. And incidentally, one of the most powerful revelations we can have is that that sacrifice is once and for all, only once, never to be repeated again. One sacrifice forever. Hallelujah. That's why when we remember the table of the Lord, we remember it with unleavened bread and unleavened wine. We don't roast a lamb. Because if we roasted a lamb, it might suggest that a lamb had to be killed each time we roasted it. It might suggest that Jesus had to die afresh each time. He does not. He died under sin once so that we could live under God. The whole problem with the Old Testament covenant was that the priests continually died, whereas we have unbroken fellowship because the Son everlastingly lives. In the Old Testament, the sacrifice had to be continually made. Now we have the sacrifice, the only real washing away of sins, completed and done once and for all, never to be repeated again. It is a mighty, tremendous and wonderful revelation. Now we come back to the word wilt, which we have seen before in these studies. I think it's used about 208 times. It's future tense, by the way. The word is only used with the second person singular pronoun. You can look, but you won't find it used any other way. You find it as thou wilt or wilt thou. And wilt thou is used either as a question or as a point of strong emphasis. It most definitely is not the past tense of will. It's a contraction of willest because it's tied to the second person pronoun and it has absolutely nothing to do with plants that wilt. Look at some examples of wilt used in these three ways as a question as an emphasis and uh, generally with the second person pronoun first of all let's look at Genesis chapter 13 verse 9 is not the whole land before thee separate thyself I pray thee from me if thou wilt take the left hand then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. First of all, notice that it's a condition. If thou wilt take the left hand, then if you do that, then I will do this. Uh, if you depart uh, uh, to the right, then I'll go to the left. Now this is a great revelation, you know. This is Abraham 
talking to Lot, after Lot and his herdsmen and his crew had been mumbling and complaining that they weren't getting a fair shake of the natural inheritance that had been promised to Abraham. When they come down out of the high country, they look out across the plains towards the sea. And there are these fertile plains spread out before them. They can see a long way. They're fertile. They're populated. They're well used. They're watered. They're great grazing and growing land. And Abraham makes this wonderful gesture. He says, look, take what you like. You take what you want. You take what you would like. He doesn't even say what you think is fair. He says, you take what you want and I will have the rest. He could say that because he knew that God's promises were on him. So he said, you take what you want. I'll take the rest. What an amazing attitude. I mean, Lot takes all of the good ground, leaves uh, Abraham with a high country. But that's another story with the rolling hills. But it's his attitude that astounds me. It reminds me of Jesus saying, look, if someone wants to take your cloak, give him your coat also. Makes you rethink perhaps what the meaning of uh, being diligent in business is. Now, if we know whom we have believed and if we are persuaded in whom we are trusting and believing, who has promised that he will always look after us, why do we fight for possession? Why do we go to law with one another? Or why do we insist on our rights? And make such a show of demanding our rights. We are the people with the promise of God. We are the people with the blessing of God. I think that Abraham's attitude here, you see, I'm a son of Abraham through faith. Faithful Abraham. His, he was righteous because of his faith. Hallelujah. I am a, of the spiritual seed of Abraham. Glory to God. I'm a child of faith. Hallelujah. I'm inheriting into the promise. Of course, the promise is in Hebrews of that God swears an oath, so he can swear by no greater, he swears by himself. And he says this same blessing that he gives Abraham saying, blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. We have unbroken fellowship. Hallelujah. He is never going to leave us. Glory to God. We can trust him for our supply. Anyway, this is a great revelation. Now let's look at um, wilt thou wilt, or wilt thou, as a question. And this is Genesis chapter 15, Verse 2, Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of mine house is Eliza of Damascus? So it's a question, what wilt thou give me? Definitely a question. Now we're going to see wilt thou used for emphasis and we turn to Acts chapter 2 verse 27 because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption used for emphasis here it's not a question and of course here we've got will again or a derivative of the verb will used in a mighty revelation. The cornerstone, the second cornerstone, the once is the death for sin, the blood shed once and for all, never having to be repeated. And the other is this, the resurrection. Hallelujah. The resurrection, never to die again. Hallelujah. The power of the resurrection, the power of our Christian life runs on the power of the resurrection. He that raised up Christ from the dead quickens our mortal bodies. 
the power of the resurrection. He's never going to die again. Remember, we come to God. We believe that he is. We confess that Jesus is the Lord with our mouth. And we believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead. Neither wilt thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. Why? Because on the third day, he rose again from the dead, never, ever, ever to die again. I'm sure you can see why these various highlighted forms of this verb will are used to establish these fundamental truths, these wonderful, life-giving, glorious, experimental truths in the fact that we can live them. You actually live them. They're not a theory. <laughs> They're a life. Sometimes the definition choices that were available to the translators, they limit them in order to provide focus. We've just seen two examples where two words are limited and uh, where a phrase of a word is, is emphasized. Wilt thou? Not only a question. Some passages in the KJV use one word repeatedly rather than frame it with alternate definitions, which of course you can do. But notice how in this next set of verses, the key word torment is magnified and strengthened by repetition. Greatly emphasized. Now this is a, a string of verses from Luke chapter 16, 23 to 28. In your notes, you'll find the, the whole passage laid out and you can underline, you know, the word. Uh, but here, I've just included the phrases as they occur within this set of verses. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments. And cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented, lest they also come into this place of torment. So you can see how when you read this passage, you end up with the idea and the concept of torment firmly embedded within your mind and brain and feeling. It is a torment. A literal torment to be left outside of the presence of God in eternity. Now here's another example of how the translators shunned using lots of definitions for the same word and focused on one single word that's found in the first epistle of John. Now in this particular, these next few slides, the study notes are quite extensive. And uh, you can be able to read them. You see, there were Gnostics then, and the quasi-Gnostics now, who hold that believers could not understand spiritual truths for themselves who hold that you can't just simply, without a specialist education, sit down and read the Bible and understand it and have spiritual revelation on it that is true and correct and correctly understand the English of it uh, without specialist knowledge, without, you know, a, uh, a definite style of education. I find it interesting that on the... 400th anniversary of the printing of the King James Bible that we've just enjoyed, that many publishers produced a replica of the 1611 AV Holy Bible. And some of them included a version of the notes that the translators were given by the king. Unfortunately, they changed them from the original 
They actually printed them in a sort of Gothic style script, old fashioned script, but they actually changed the wording. They thought they were modernizing the wording and in so doing it, they changed the meaning of it. The original instructions gave leave for anybody who loved and read the scriptures and knew the scriptures to look at and question any, redition, uh, any rendition or editing during the editing of the preparation of the AV 1611 Holy Bible. And when these modern day publishers produce this uh, copy of the notes to the translators, the copy states that the critics or those that seek to edit or add criticism to the edits that were being done, those people must be lettered. In other words, have degrees, have official recognition. Who says Gnosticism is dead? For further details, please see the notes on the next slide. Once again, you know, we're inclined to forget the revelation of the Reformation, both in terms of Hebrews 9.10 and the 31st of October. The only reason we, we needed the, Ref the Reformation of 1517 is that the church had fallen into the Dark Ages. It started out well, but uh, it got taken over with uh, fables, the commandments of men put forward as the commandments of God and science falsely so called. Of course, the true church was always there. There have always been believers, praise God. Uh, pockets of them, sometimes many, sometimes few. Praise God for the Reformation. Gnosticism is just a word. But the Gnostics believe only a few elite, professionally trained souls, people, were endowed with the ability to know the secrets of God, the mysteries of God, the truth of God, the revelation of God. Therefore, men of the clergy, those with university diplomas or seminary degrees, were touted as the ultimate authorities in matters of faith and practice, and particularly in telling us what the Word of God actually says. Now concerning my statement about the publishers of the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible, unfortunately I've misplaced my source documents. I can't look through my material like I used to be able to. It was an inclusion in a presentation pack from Nelson's the publishers concerning their printing of the 400th anniversary edition of the King James Bible. I found the presentation box, but that particular pamphlet isn't in it. However, consider the following quotes. Now, in the notes, I've quoted them, and, and you can look at them quite uh, clearly. I've listed the rules as they were. I've also included um, an excerpt from uh, the hidden history uh, of our Bible uh, by Gail Ripplinger. She has an excellent article in there. And I've quoted it. Let me read a little bit to you. Unlike any English Bible translation, either before or since, the translation was open to all Christians according to Rule 11, 12 and 13. Men throughout the kingdom, from pastors to deans to professors to learned men to bishops and to any spiritual plowman, who had taken pains in their private studies of the scriptures were asked to study the translation and send such their observations so that our said intended translation 
may have the help and furtherance of all. Any man in the land could review the work. To, to accomplish this review, each company made and passed about copies of the work. Manuscripts were prepared and sent out for the scrutiny of men throughout the kingdom. This participation of all men within this our kingdom from as far and wide as for general scrutiny is unique. Nobody else has done it. No other Bible translators have done it. And Gail Ripplinger, in this note, you'll find it in the, in the workbooks, gives the quotes of all the people that she has quoted and authors that she's quoted over the years and the time uh, to produce those comments. Praise God. God looks out of his word. He that willeth to do my will shall know. So the, the Gnostics are wrong. <laughs> It's easy to get a, a, a grip on the English of the King James Bible because it's mainly Anglo-Saxon words, as I've said many, many times. And if you want to train your mind, train your mind the way that, that it was intended to be trained. Start reading at Genesis and read consecutively through and your mind will start to be able to deal with the English of the King James Bible. And particularly, it's its grammar and sentence structure. Now getting back to John's epistle, or John the Apostle was dogmatic in his dismissal of the Gnostics in First John. And the KJV translators kept his passion by not substituting any other definitions for the most pivotal word of this letter, the word no. He used the word no, including its derivatives knoweth and known, 31 times in this relatively brief epistle. Actually, it's used 1,291-odd times in the Bible. And by using it so many times, 31 times in just a, a short letter, really, he reveals his attitude about knowing and how easy it is. And the King James translators reveal their fidelity and focus by keeping it the same word. And one of the verses that I have always loved and noted is 1 John as chapter 2 verse 13. And you'll see that all age groups know. So the old men, yes, well you might expect that, but the young men too know. But so do the little children know. Hallelujah. You don't need specialist knowledge. These are important considerations because we're called upon to know the scriptures for ourselves. You know, Paul talking about Timothy says, you've known the scriptures from your youth. You don't need specialist knowledge or a higher education. You don't need to be amongst the intelligentsia, academia. This is not a burden, knowing the scriptures for ourselves. It's a privilege to know the scriptures for ourselves. Look at Acts 17, verse 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word of God in all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether these things were so. Now, if you read this passage, I think a difficulty is that we tend to read verses here. But if you read the whole passage, the Jews at Berea received and searched the scriptures. The Jews in Thessalonica, because Paul went to both synagogues, did not. And of course, they get mad and chase across to persecute. 
I mean, you can read it for yourself. So do you want to be like the Jews who search for themselves, the Jews at Berea, or are you going to be like the Jews at Thessalonica? Because the choice is yours. Are you going to read the scriptures for yourself? Because that's what I believe God wants you to do. Read the scriptures for yourself. And the reason that I'm taking the trouble to do these is so that you'll get a, your appetite will be whetted so that you want to and realize that you can read the scriptures with understanding, with meaning for yourself. Praise his mighty name. Amen. Well, we come to the end of chapter 17 and look forward to having you back for chapter 18.